Clint Goss, and this is the second of two videos, uh, Native American flute basics videos. This is video number two of the series on maintaining your flute. Of course, Vera and I didn't invent all of these ideas and techniques. Uh, they were shared with us by many generous people in the flute community over the years, especially the flute makers. Have a chat with a flute maker, and you'll learn a tremendous amount about this instrument, especially how they make their instruments. This particular instrument is a good example of a contemporary Native American flute. It's not particularly fancy. Uh, it was actually made by Vera from a flute making kit uh, back in 2004. It was kind of a group class. And believe me, this is a basic instrument. Uh, Vera does not have a lot of experience making flutes. I don't have a lot of experience making flutes. But you can get instruments from a whole range of experienced flute makers out there. They're working in different woods. Uh, their instruments have different styles and keys and tunings. There's a tremendous amount of variability out there. But even this very simple instrument, uh, made from a kit, produces a beautiful sound. You could make your CD on this, uh, on this instrument. Um, as a flute player, I really think it's important to uh, understand how the flute works in its basics, how it produces sound and how to control the sound, and how to assemble and adjust the flute and uh, keep it playing at its best. So the first thing we're going to do is this external block on the top is removable, and I'm going to untie the strap, the block also called a bird, a fetish, an effigy, or a totem. This is very important. It actually starts the air inside the flute vibrating. When you remove it, you see that it covers up two holes. If you look carefully at this area, you'll see the flute actually has two chambers separated by a solid plug or divider. This two-chamber design is a key element of Native American flutes. I think it's a real innovation in the world of flutes. It makes the instrument much easier to play for musicians, especially with less experience. The first chamber, or the slow air chamber, collects the player's breath, smooths it out a bit, and sends it on to the second chamber, the sound chamber, where it vibrates to create sound. In this close-up, you see that the external block routes the air from the first chamber to the sound chamber. That's a description of the basics of how Native American flutes make sound. If you're interested in more details, we do have a flute cast on how flutes work. It really gets into the physics of how vibrating air columns work and how the whole flute operates. So the job of the external block is to direct the air from the first chamber to the sound hole, the second hole here. And that sound hole, that second hole, is at the head of the sound chamber and the sound chamber is going to control the air and get it vibrating and create sound. To do that, the bottom of the block has to make a very tight seal with the body of the flute. It also has to be positioned just right. If I breathe onto a mirror, I fog it up. That fog is moisture from my lungs, carried on my breath, and condensing out onto the mirror. The same thing happens inside a flute. When we play, the moisture condenses out inside the flute and it collects as liquid moisture. This causes all kinds of issues. First of all, you might hear your sound deteriorating as you continue to play. Moisture collecting in the channel underneath the block disturbs the airflow of the sound chamber. It literally drowns out your sound. The sound might deteriorate so much that it disappears completely. Most players call this watering out. Here's a Native American flute that has been cut open lengthwise. It shows how shallow the air channel is. It doesn't take much moisture to clog it up. Also, moisture and wood is not a great combination. The moisture will cause the wood to swell. Uh, in extreme cases, the swelling can change the sound of your flute. Uh, really extreme cases, it can cause a crack. Uh, crack down the side of the flute. Now a crack can be repaired, but it's better to try to avoid these problems by reducing moisture in the first place. Um, if you uh, do have a crack in your flute, if you look at the side of your flute, it's a good idea to look at your flute uh, before you play it uh, carefully. Um, if you do develop a crack, that can be repaired. First thing to do is take it back to the maker. Um, but you can also uh, add a binding to the flute. We have a flute cast on adding bindings to your flute. And it's actually pretty easy to do and a lot of fun, and it adds a decoration to your flute. 
One thing I do is swallow before I play. Swallowing really reduces the amount of moisture you're going to breathe into the flute, but after a while, depending on the flute I'm playing, it also depends on the temperature in the room. Uh, it's a, more of a problem if the room is colder. Um, after a while, you're going to start hearing the sound deteriorate. Um, you might even start to see moisture in the sound, uh, the sound hole area. Um, here's a technique I use, uh, especially if I need to keep on playing, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take the flute, let me hold it sideways so you can see this, and I'm going to take it from its normal playing position and rotate it 180 degrees so that the external block, the bird, is facing down. And then I'm going to breathe out the moisture. Now, instead of just breathing through the flute and making that loud whistle sound, I'm going to take my finger and very carefully, gently, place it in the sound hole area just so that it disturbs how the flute vibrates, and instead of a loud whistle, I'm going to create a wind sound. You're going to feel a moisture coming out against your finger. Um, you can blow quite forcibly once you get used to it and create a wind sound. You could even use the wind sound if you're performing as part of a performance. Just make sure that you're not going to get any uh, moisture onto the microphone. One thing you can do if you've got a bit more time is to take your flute and turn it head down and tap out the moisture against a cloth. I often do this against my thigh and uh, I'm using a microfiber cloth. That's uh, really good because you can uh, uh, use it to really absorb a lot of moisture and then toss it in the washing machine. The thing we see a lot of people do, um, you might even see performers do this sometimes, is to wick out the, you know, especially against the floor um, to try to, to try to push out the moisture. Uh, it works, uh, but it also tends to crack a lot of flutes. Uh, a lot of flutes get broken like that by hitting them against the floor or hitting them against uh, an object. And you're also going to spray who's ever around you with your breath moisture. Not a good idea. If I play a flute more than 10 or 15 minutes a day, or I've got any kind of a sense that there's moisture inside the flute, I think it's a really good idea to open up the body of the flute, open up and remove the lacing, and remove the bird, and let it dry overnight. Removing this, uh, the block, the bird, uh, it might make you a little nervous, but I think it's very important that every flute maker should learn how to remove the block on every one of their flutes and learn how to reposition it um, and put it back together again. If this is the first time you're removing the block, you might want to take a photo first, especially if the flute maker used some unusual method to tie the block on, or there's some ornate or special lacing method on your flute. Uh, this will help you get the block tied back together later. When I untie the lacing, I'll loosen the knot, typically by pulling the lacing to one side. If there's other things on the flute, such as tape or rubber bands, I'll remove those as well. Take off the block and look at the base on the underside of the block. Is it raw wood or is it finished? Does it look like it's in good shape? Do the same for the nest area, the place where the block sits on the body of the flute. The moisture from our breath can carry food particles or other stuff that can crystallize out onto the block or onto the nest area after the moisture evaporates. If you see any evidence of these deposits, they might be changing the airflow underneath the block and changing the sound of the flute. However, you need to be very, very careful in this area because it's easy to damage the block and the nest area and alter the sound of the flute permanently, especially if these areas have no protective finish. So if the flute needs cleaning, you can very gently clean it with a soft cloth or a microfiber cloth. I have a new flute, I'll first experiment with the position of the block just by holding it in my hands. There's no lacing involved here. Um, if I just breathe into the flute without any block, don't hear any sound, aside from the wind sound, because the air is going out and it isn't being directed to the sound hole, so there's no resonance in the, uh, in the sound chamber there. If I add the block with my hand, I'm going to add it up very high to start with, and I'm going to gradually move it down and hear how it changes the sound. A 
As I slide the block down further, there's a sweet spot, a place where the flute sounds really good. If I keep on going, the sound deteriorates. Eventually, I lose the sound quality altogether. All flutes are different, even two flutes from the same flute maker. So it's really important on every flute to find the best position for the bird that produces the sound that you like the best out of that flute. For most flutes, that position is going to be where the front of the block lines up with the head end of the sound hole. Now you might have a block that has these side wings, like on this flute, and these extend around the sound hole, but there's still a face to the block, and that's the location you want to line up at the top of the sound hole. Now that you've experimented with the position of the block just using your finger, it's time to do it with the lacing. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do this. Some people hold the flute under their arm like this and cradle it. The way I've learned is actually hold it in my hand and hold the block position with my finger. It doesn't have to be perfect at this point, it just has to be close. And I'll drape the lacing over the block. I'll center it so that the ends of the lacing come about, you know, come out about the same. And then I'll start taking wraps. Okay, one wrap. Because these are long, I'm going to do two wraps with each of the two ends of the lacing. And now this will produce a total of five wraps. You can do three wraps for shorter lacing. You can do five wraps for longer race, lacing. If you want an even number of wraps, begin on the bottom of the flute and make it even on the bottom of the flute, and then you can do two wraps or four wraps. But this, starting from the top of the flute, produced five wraps, and then I'll turn it over. I'll actually put it under my arm at this point, and I've now got the two ends. I'll hold them taut in my two fingers, and I'll take a simple over-under. It's like the knot you first use when you're tying your shoe. Then I'll pull it up and snug it down. Most of these are leather, and they're fairly strong, and they also provide consistent tension. I'll then take the flute and eyeball where it is that I want the position. I should have a good idea on my flute, and I should be able to get close by eyeballing it. And I'll try it. I might be tempted to move it back a scooch. Listen carefully. Move it forward a two scooches. And, yep, and that deteriorated the sound a little bit. First guess, or maybe a scooch back was perfect on this. I'm going to go with a scooch back. Now, there are some specialty cases. Uh, there are some makers that make their flutes with what's called a spacer plate. Here's an example of what a spacer plate looks like. You'll need to get both the spacer plate and the block adjusted correctly. It's not hard to do, but it does take a little bit more jockeying than flutes with uh, no spacer plates. Another thing you might consider, I do do it on some of my flutes, is once you get the ideal position that you like and really experiment with moving it back and forth micro amounts to you really listen to the sound of the flute. Uh, you could even record the sound of the flute to get the absolute ideal position. After I do that, I'll take a straight edge and lay it across both the uh, external block and the body of the flute, and also the spacer plate. If it has a spacer plate, I'll lay that straight edge across, and I'll take uh, a pencil, and I'll make a tick on the external block, the body of the flute, as well as the spacer plate if I have one. And then I can easily get a first approximation to where I want the position of the bird, uh, the block, when I'm putting the flute back on. One option if you're uncomfortable with taking off the uh, block and putting it back on again is to wait till you're, you have a, a more experienced flute player around. You could wait till your flute circle or you go to a, a show or, or visit the flute maker and uh, then you can do it with them around in case you run into trouble. 
Another good thing is to know the kind of finish that was used uh, on the surface of the flute, uh, as well as inside both the slow air chamber, the first chamber, and the uh, sound chamber. Uh, that helps you maintain the flute. I, uh, I record it. I actually keep it in a, a spreadsheet with my flutes. Uh, there's a lot of finishes. You could have shellac or lacquer or tongue oil or polyurethane or epoxy. Uh, there's also varnishes, uh, mineral oil, beeswax, canuba wax, or it could be uh, unfinished, just the natural finish of the wood. And eventually over time, as you hold the flute, uh, you can get uh, the oils from your hand. Uh, coming out on the flute. It's important to know so that you can maintain it in the long run, maybe uh, handle scratches that happen or how to, uh, uh, how to keep the uh, flute in good condition. Uh, for example, if you have a, a flute that's been oiled, well, then the oils adding more oil is usually okay. Again, talk to the flute maker. Uh, but if you had a, a flute with a polyurethane finish, if you just added oil, you'd get kind of a messy surface. And you can clean it off, but it really doesn't uh, do any good to put oil on top of polyurethane. So talk to your flute maker. Another thing you might want to consider is uh, protecting your flute. Uh, there are these flute socks that offer some protection. Uh, I just usually I put the flute in uh, head down and there's often a, uh, a way to cinch up the top of the flute sock. And from here uh, I put it into, if I'm going to take my flute anywhere, I put it into one of these flute cases, uh, which are uh, fairly simple affairs. It's a PVC tube with a, a surface that's been uh, added on the outside and a strap up top, a zipper up top to close it up. And it makes it quite sturdy, um, good for airplane travel. You can take your flutes on airplanes. There are specific requirements, but you can take it as carry-on, in addition to your other carry-on currently, you don't have to put it uh, as checked luggage. There's a lot of uh, sizes of these cases. Once you become a real flute addict, you can get different sizes. These are different lengths and designs, and uh, you can get ones with multiple tubes in them for carrying uh, serious flute addictions. And also consider uh, putting a little sticker inside your flute that uh, asks anybody who might find the case if you've lost it, ask them to return it and tell them where to return it. And I actually put uh, that I'll, I'll provide a reward for return of these uh, instruments. So that's an overview of the basics of maintaining and adjusting your flute, everything we can think of. Um, and of course, we'd love to have you join us uh, in person at one of our workshops where we really get into the nitty gritty of just about anything to do with the Native American flute, including playing techniques and playing in groups and playing solo, and also details of recording and uh, facilitating flute circles. So we would love to have you join us at a workshop.